Please join me in welcoming Kathy Sanders. I would speak to his rotary group I said sure I'd like to I, I'd do that and then he said well you only have 20 minutes I said, I, sorry Fred I, I've got a big story I can't tell it in 20 minutes and he goes well let me see if I can get you 30 minutes and I said well if you can get me 30 minutes I'll try so I kind of been stressing out about it it's like what if I go 33 minutes? <laughs> I said, like, those folks are going to be so mad at me. And then I thought, hey, Kathy, you wrote a whole book on forgiveness. It's now you see me, now I forgave the unforgivable. And you're going to be talking to those folks for a half hour about forgiving. Surely at the end of the program, if I go over, you guys will forgive me. Right? <laughs> I, I'm hoping so. How many of y'all remember what you were doing when you heard about the Oklahoma City bombing? I thought so. It's just one of those things in our life that uh, imprints our life, isn't it, that we remember, just like we did the Kennedy assassination. So before I begin my program, Larry, I'm going to ask you if you would cue up my video. And I've got a video here. It's just a few minutes long. April 19th, 1995. The date marks the worst U.S. terrorist attack in history. Before 9-11, the worst terrorist attack on American soil happened in Oklahoma City. And it was domestic terrorism. Kathy Sanders lost two of her young grandchildren in the bombing. Kathy Sanders' memories of April 19th, 1995 are vivid and painful. It was the day Terry Nichols and Timothy McVeigh bombed the Alfred P. Murrah building in Oklahoma City. 168 people were killed, including her two grandsons, Chase and Colton. Uh, north away from the federal building, you see them uh, waving people off saying, get away from the building. Another bomb, move back. Her mom's in there. Get him! Get him! Get him! Get him! Get him! Edie and I walk worked just a couple of blocks from the building and when the bomb went off we ran down there and when we looked at the building there on the north side it was nothing left but a pancake pile of rubble. Blast came through the, the windows, blew us out of our chairs onto the floor. We know what happened, just the blast. Uh, just a tremendous explosion. The ceiling, the windows came in. Death. It is chaos down here. That's the thing that's going through my mind right now. This is something that happens somewhere else. This is something that happens in places like Beirut, uh, places far, far away, places with strange sounding names. It's not something that's supposed to happen in places like Oklahoma City. supposed to roof a house on April 19th. Instead, he 
walked straight into the halls of hell. You know, that was the devil's hand, you know, casting a dagger of death into the heart of the United States of America. I found three or four of the little guys, you know, bless her little hearts, you know. They were just, you know, but they never knew a thing, though, you know. It was all over so fast, it, you know. They never, they never felt a hint of pain, that, you know. And it was just like a candle. It's burning, and then it's gone. They, they were with God after that. Edie fell to her knees, my babies, my babies. And it was the first time in my daughter's life that she had a problem that her mother couldn't fix. Consumed with bitterness and hatred, Kathy became depressed and even contemplated suicide. April 19th is a day of great loss for me. I wish I could take April 19th off the calendar. Then she realized there was only one way she could move on with her life. In her book, Now You See Me, Kathy tells how she found peace by forgiving the two men who caused her and many others so much pain. Now You See Me is a book Kathy Sanders did not plan on writing about a life at one point she would have rather ended. After the bombing, I wanted to die. I just wanted to kill myself. I didn't want to live in a world filled with such pain. I didn't know how I was going to cope or if I would survive. I didn't sit out ever intending to forgive Terry Nichols, Timothy McVeigh, or anyone else involved in this crime. But learning to forgive was a gift I gave myself. And I don't know what my prayers did for Nichols or McVeigh, but I do know when I began to pray for them, it began to change my life. She's aware that forgiving the unforgivable may appall others who lived through April 19th, yet insists it is the only way she could move on and focus now on happy memories made with two precious little boys. What I have today is peace from learning to forgive. I've got a song in my heart and a smile on my face. yesterday and then sometimes it seems like a whole lifetime ago. This morning I'd like to take you on a journey. I want you to go back in time with me just a little ways. I want you to meet my family. This is my mom and my dad and my brother and I. When I grew up in Dell City, Oklahoma, I grew it was a different time in our world and my parents were staunch Southern Baptists. I'm telling you, we were at church every time the doors were open. My daddy was a Baptist deacon and my mother was a Sunday school teacher. We were there Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, Tuesday night visitation. I remember one time, uh, mother came into the bedroom to get me up one Sunday morning. and said, get up, Kathy, get up. It's time for church. And I pulled the covers up over my head and I said, oh, Mama, do I have to go to church? And she said, no, honey, you don't have to go to church. You get to go to church. Going to church is a privilege. And that's how I was raised. I loved the Lord as a little girl. I can remember in my fifth grade classroom, our teacher, Mr. Tilly, he would start every morning of class with a word of prayer and a Bible devotion. I was kind of a strange kid, and those of you that know me might think I'm a strange adult. But I wanted to be in bed every night at 9 o'clock because I had a standing appointment with Jesus. 
I loved to pray. I knew he was expecting me to be there and to pray. I didn't give my parents a lot of trouble. And by the time of the bombing, I was happily married. I was living in Northwest Oklahoma City with my husband. My daughter was a young divorced mother and she had moved home with my two little grandsons, Chase and Colton. And I'm telling you, those little boys were the light of our lives. Everything in our lives evolved around these little boys. Edie and I worked together in downtown Oklahoma City and we co-parented these children together. I remember the morning of the bombing, the boys had the bedroom next to me and I went in to get them up, to get them ready for daycare. And when I went in their room, they weren't there, which was odd because that never happens. I walked down the hall to my daughter's bedroom and I flipped on the light switch and there on either side of my daughter's was her two little sons. Sometime during the night, those two little boys toddled down the hall where they got in bed with their mama, where they spent the last night of their lives. Edie was excited to go to work that morning. We started preparing the boys to get them ready for the day. She had stayed home on Monday and Tuesday before the bombing on Wednesday because she had been sick and she had planned to stay home on Wednesday as well, but the night before she got a call from a co-worker that said, Edie, you've got to come to work tomorrow because we're having the office birthday parties and I've baked you a cake. So we dropped the little boys off at daycare and went on to our building where we worked together. I went up to my office and I was sitting at my desk when I heard a loud explosion unlike anything I had ever seen and heard in my life. I knew something terribly was wrong. I grabbed my purse and I ran down to my off daughter's office. And when I got there, everyone was looking out the windows trying to figure out what in the world had happened. Edie had been walking across the floor to blow out the candles on her birthday cake when the bomb went off. I remember her telling me, Mama, I don't ever want to have another birthday. Well, then someone hung up the phone and made it an announcement. Hey, they just blew up the bank that was downtown, right across from us. And I said, Edie, let's go see. So we ran down three flights of stairs out the front door of our building. And when we did it, it was as though we entered the twilight zone. We had just dropped the boys off at the Murrah building, and it was intact. We look up the street, and we see where the bank was. Uh, the bank is intact, but there's big sheets of plate glass falling down all around us. There's not a car one in the street. I'm telling you, it was like we were in the twilight zone. My daughter turns to go back into our building where it was safe, and I look up the street at the Murrah, and I see smoke rising from it. And I said, Edie, the babies. And we take off running that three blocks. And when we got to the south side of the building, which is what you see here, the building was intact, but the windows had been blown out. And the blinds were just kind of waving in the wind. And we're standing there trying to figure out what in the world has happened. And then we hear this boom, 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 and we hear, see new clouds of black billowing smoke. And what we were hearing were the cars blowing up in the parking lot. Then we turned and we looked at the north side of the building. And there on the second floor where the daycare once was, there was nothing left but a pancake pile of gravel. My babies, my babies, Edie said as she fell to her knees, and I knew it was the first time in my daughter's life she was having a problem that her mama wasn't going to be able to take care of. That morning, there came a second bomb threat, and people are yelling and running, stampeding away from the building, saying, get back, get back. Well, we didn't want to get back. Our children were in there. We were trying to get into the building. 
We were finally forced by law enforcement officials to leave the area. We were told, go to the children's hospital. That's where the children will be taken when they're removed from the building. So that's what we did. <clears throat> we could get a long way. And I lost all track of time. I couldn't tell you what time of morning it was. But in walks my son, the policeman. He was off duty that day, and he had been watching the coverage of the bombing on TV. And when he saw his mom and his sister on TV, he knew he had to get down there and find us, and he did. He said, Mama, don't worry, I'm going to find the boys. And he left. And when he came back, I knew when I looked at his face, something was wrong. I said, what is it, son, what is it? And he said, Mama, did Colton have all little green shorts and a white shirt? And I said, yes, son, that's Colton. Big old tears came down my son's eyes. And he put his arms around me. And I said, son, is the baby gone? Is the baby gone? And he hugged me and he said, yes, Mama, he's gone. And he held me for a few minutes and then he sat me in a chair and he said, Mama, where's Edie? I'm going to tell her. I said, son, she's around the corner in the chaplain's office. And in a few minutes, I heard a blood-curdling scream, and I knew my son had found my daughter. Life as we knew it was over. When we went out, life as we knew it was over, we later found out from, us, from the rescue worker who went in to find my youngest grandson, Colton, that he went in the building trying to find someone that was alive. He was stepping over dead bodies and he heard Colton whimpering in the rubble and he dug him out. He said he was going to try to help him and apply CPR or something, but there was nothing he could do because he had been gutted by a glass shard. He lay him there on the side of the, uh, on a bench by the side of the rubble when the second bomb threat came. My son left again that day and he found my oldest grandson toe-tagged in the back of a refrigerated truck being used for a makeshift morgue. And I have to tell you, when we went out to our car, it still had the children's car seats in the back of it. We were devastated. It was hard to believe that these little boys had been erased from our lives. I didn't think bad things were supposed to happen to good people. I prayed for those little boys every day of their lives. I had to wonder, my belief system was challenged. How could a good and loving God allow that to happen to me? I went home and that night I turned on the TV and there's one of the surviving parents <coughs> holding his little boy and he said, you know what, I just prayed and asked God for a little boy to hold and God answered my prayer and here's my child. And you know, he didn't do anything wrong. If our children would have lived, I would have probably done the same thing. But I realize now, I mean, that was a kick in the gut to our family. And I realize now, God's not a cherry picker. The morning of the bombing, he didn't say, I'm going to save this child and this child and this child, and I'm going to let the others perish. God just didn't work that way. I watched my husband, and his anger scared me. He was so mad. I finally came to the decision with, Lord, if you're really out there and you're who you say you are, you're going to have to help me because I can't get through this alone. <clears throat> and it was the first time in my life I ever thought about killing myself because I couldn't imagine living in a world filled with such pain. You might remember a few days after the bombing, before a lot of the bodies were removed from the building, and before we had our boys' funeral, there was a national memorial service held at the Oklahoma City Fairgrounds. There were dignitaries from all over the country there, and one of them was Bill Clinton, President Clinton. And I can remember him saying, he was assuring us that everyone that was involved in this crime was going to be prosecuted to the full extent of the law. And if you've ever had a loved one murdered, that's pretty important to you. Well, within a few days, my husband and I began to have questions. One of the young mothers who had left her 
dropped her son off at daycare the morning of the bombing, told us that she had seen the bomb squad downtown before the bomb went off. And we're going, oh, how do you know? How do you know it was the bomb squad? We just couldn't believe it. <laughs> and she said they had big blue letters on their jackets and they were combing the bushes out front. Well, my husband went down to the fire station and he talked to the fire chief. And he said, did you all have prior knowledge? Was the bomb squad downtown the morning of the bombing? And he's, the chief said, oh, I, absolutely not. Our, our bomb truck wasn't down there. Then you can see in the little article that's there, there was a newspaper that ran an article where they interviewed a whole office full of people who had been watching that bomb squad in the alleyway. And it wasn't just the bomb truck. The truck was pulling the bomb disposal unit behind it. When confronted with that information, the fire chief held a press conference and he said that he had made a mistake, that his guys were down there that morning, that they were just running routine errands and stopped to get a cup of coffee. And I guess we could have left it at that until they called off the manhunt for John Doe number two. Now that was the largest manhunt in American history at that time. And within just a few days, the FBI said, you know, it was all a mistake. There is no John Doe number two. Well, there were 22 eyewitnesses that saw Timothy McVeigh downtown the morning of the bombing, and not one saw him alone. Many of those eyewitnesses described the same dark-skinned man with the flames on his ball cap. And one of those eyewitnesses even picked Timothy McVeigh out of the line, out of the lineup. That concerned us. Another thing that concerned us was what was happening at the Dreamland Motel in Junction City, Kansas. That's where Timothy McVeigh stayed the week before the bombing. McVeigh drove from the Dreamland with the bomb truck, with the bomb in the back, to the front doors of the Murrah Building and blew it up. And while he was staying at the Dreamland, as according to other guests, the housekeeper, the owner of the motel, and the Chinese delivery boy, there were men coming and going from his room. And those men were never identified. That was very disturbing to our family. I watched my husband. He, his anger just consumed him. He was mad at God for not answering our prayers. <coughs> He was mad at Timothy McVeigh. I heard him say a dozen times, I can't wait until they execute McVeigh. I'm going to spit on his grave and toast his death with a bottle of wine champagne. And he was mad at the federal government because he didn't believe we had been given the truth. I watched as anger consumed my 47-year-old husband. I learned a lot from watching him die. I learned that harboring bitterness and hatred in your heart is like drinking poison and expecting the enemy to die. He was consumed by it, and I think that's what led to his early demise. Shortly after his death, I moved to Denver, Colorado to attend Terry Nichols' trial, and it was there that I had my first baby step toward learning to forgive, something I never even planned to do. The court was in session, and when the judge recessed, I went out into the hallway, and in the hallway was this little woman in a long brown coat, and she kind of looked like that Aunt B persona off of the Andy Griffith show. And I could tell people were talking about her, but not to her. And then I realized, oh my goodness, that's Terry Nichols' mother. Can you imagine how horrid this must be for her? And I went over to her. And I began to introduce myself, and she began to cry, and she said, I know who you are. I've seen you on TV. And I put my arms together, and I said, I want you to know how sorry I am for you. And that began a strange friendship between the two of us. We began to sit together in the courtroom, and we began to eat lunch together. And it wasn't long before Terry Nichols, the bomber, became my friend. Joyce's son. 
Now, I attended that trial because I needed some answers to some of my questions, the ones I posed earlier about who these other people were. And I thought maybe I'd get some answers there, but I didn't. And at the end of the trial, even the jury had a problem, and the judge declared them hung during the sentencing phase because the jury forewoman uh, made a press announcement, and she said, we know Nichols is guilty, but we don't know how guilty. We want to know who those other people were with McVeigh and Nichols. The government agreed that the bomb was built out at Gary Lake, and there were men seen coming and going from the bomb truck while they were building it. So Nichols escaped the death penalty because the jury couldn't decide how guilty he was. Well, it wasn't long after the trial that Terry Nichols was moved back to Oklahoma City because Oklahoma City kind of had a black backup plan. In Denver was the federal trial, and McVeigh and Nichols were only charged for the eight deaths of the federal agents. So Oklahoma City brought Nichols back to stand trial in Oklahoma, hoping to have him executed. Well, I went to my mailbox, and I saw that I had a letter from Terry Nichols. It's like, wow. What's he writing to me for? What does he want? And it took me a while to even open the letter because I thought, I'm not looking for a pen pal, and if, it was, if I was, it wouldn't be the Oklahoma City bomber. And then I thought about it for a while, and I thought, well, who's going to know more about what really happened than the bomber himself? And I thought, perhaps if I befriended him, I could get him to talk. You see, at that point in my life, I was willing to dance with the devil to get to the truth. So I wrote back to Terry Nichols. And it wasn't long before our letters turned into phone calls, and our phone calls turned into personal visits. I learned a lot about Terry Nichols over those two years he was housed in Oklahoma City. I learned that he wasn't raised in a Christian home. He said in his house, the only time they ever went to church was for funerals or dinners, or funerals or weddings, and he laughed and he said, we only went then to get the free dinner. But he told me after he was arrested, <coughs> there was nothing in his cell but a Gideon Bible. And he said he read it cover to cover two or three times. And then somehow he got his hands on an AM radio. And he heard an old radio preacher tell him that if he would invite Jesus into his heart, that Jesus would cleanse him of his sins and would forgive him of his sins and cleanse him of all unrighteousness. Now, Terry Nichols told me he did that. I'm nobody's judge, but I chose to believe him. And I know about jailhouse religion, where people profess to become Christians so they can make it good with the parole board. And I know there's certainly no atheist in the foxhole when Terry Nichols was in the foxhole of me. But I chose, him to, I chose to forgive him. Now let me stop right here and say, did I forgive Terry Nichols? Yes, I did. Do I think he should be punished? Yes, I do. I think forgiveness and punishment are two different things. I continued my quest for the truth. And one of the places I wanted to go was Elohim City. Now it's on the Oklahoma-Arkansas border, and I talked to my daughter into going here with me. And you might want to, you might say, well, why in the world did you want to go there? Well, I'll tell you. Timothy McVeigh, a boy from New York City, in the months before the bombing, got a speeding ticket outside the gates of Bellingham City. Not only that, but his telephone records reflected that he called Elohim City the week before the bombing, two minutes after calling the Ryder Truck Rental Company. And we thought that was pretty significant. But the most damning piece of evidence we found was when we met this young lady. This is confidential informant number 183. She was working for the ATF. I've seen her handwritten reports to her handler where she warns the ATF 
that the people at this compound were planning a bombing. She went on rendezvous to Oklahoma City on three different occasions targeting buildings that they planned to blow up, and one of them was the Federal Building. When my daughter and I drove up to that compound, I'd never seen anything like this at all. At all. The sign said Elohim City. Well, Elohim City is Hebrew for City of God. Right, Zig? That's right. Yeah. He, he's my pastor. He knows all about that Hebrew stuff. Okay, so it's for Hebrew for city of God. And I'm thinking, nobody is ever going to believe I've been here. So I got the video camera out, and I started taping to, so I would have proof to show someone that my daughter and I had been there. Well, all of a sudden, my daughter Edie yells, put the camera down, Mom, put the camera down. She scared me to death. I knew something was wrong, so I threw the camera in the floor, and I looked up, and there were two men with guns pointed directly at us. I don't know about you, but that kind of stuff don't happen to me every day, and I was scared. As you say, no, no, no. When the men came to the car, I told them, I had been told that if you wanted an audience with these people and to talk, to gain their confidence, you had to attend their church service. So I told them we're here to attend the 12 noon church service. So our armed guards took us into their sanctuary, which was another large domed building. When we walked in, it's like oozing stuff. I don't know what that crap is they had on the, on the ceiling, but it was bad. <coughs> Inside the auditorium, it was set up horseshoe shaped. And in the middle of the horseshoe, there were men walking around with the guns, on their arms singing praises to God in a circle while the Iron Cross band played. When the band was through playing, Pastor Robert Millar, the founder of Elohim City, said, I see we have guests. Would you please stand up and introduce yourselves? So Edie and I stood up and I told them who we were and that we'd lost our grandson lost my grandchildren in the Oklahoma City bombing, and I followed it by saying, we're ATF's worst nightmare. And when I did, we got a standing ovation. The next place I wanted to go was the Aryan Nation compound in Hayden Lake, Idaho. And I wanted to go there because I knew Terry Nichols had been, I, Timothy McVeigh had been through there, and they helped shape his hateful ideals. I wanted to know everything I could about Timothy McVeigh and Terry Nichols and why they would do such a horrible thing. Only this time, when I went to Hayden Lake, Idaho, I couldn't talk my daughter into going with me. So when I drove up to the gate, I saw the Nazi flag blowing there in the air. And I drove down the drive, and it was a long drive. <coughs> and as I went further into the compound, I passed this guard shack that said, for white kindred only. I drove a little further, and then I saw this building with the Nazi swastika on it. When I got all the way into the compound at the end of the road, there was this church, the Church of Jesus Christ Christian. Is what the Arians call the church. You can't see it in this slide, but to the left there was a large grove of shade trees. And out under those shade trees were men that looked like this. It was the Aryan Brotherhood. Have any of you seen that movie Cujo about the rabid St. Bernard dog? Okay, you can appreciate this. When I went to get out of that my car, there was a large common <coughs> shepherd dog that came and lunged on the door. And as he came at me, I hopped in the car and I shut the door, and the Aryans were laughing at me. They called the dog off, and I got back out of the car, and I said, I'm here to see Pastor Richard Butler. 
He's what I call the head of the snake. He's the head of that vile organization. They took me into his home, and I visited with him for a while, and then he invited me to attend his church service. When I walked into the foyer, there was an Israeli flag on the floor where the members wiped their feet. And there was the worst kind of racist propaganda I have ever seen in my life. I've never seen anything like it before or after. When I went into the auditorium, instead of stained glass windows, there were these Nazi flags. <coughs> I looked down the aisle toward the front of the church where the podium was, and there was a life-size bust of Adolf Hitler. They all sang Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound, and then they ended it with a Heil Hitler. Pastor Butler got up, and he began to preach. And he looked directly at me, and he said, I want you to know that God's laid a new message on my heart. And he began to tell me that one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter, and that Timothy McVeigh was a great man and a martyr for the cause. He actually cried as he told me how sorry he was about my little Aryan grandchildren. No one had ever talked about my grandchildren in that way. <coughs> As I left the compound that day, I thought about the words of Martin Luther King. He said, darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. <coughs> I've learned that forgiveness is not an event. It's a process. It takes time. I didn't just wake up one morning and think, Wow, this would be a great day to forgive those guys that murdered my grandchildren. <coughs> it just didn't happen that way. I remember struggling with it and reading my Bible. In the, in the Lord's Prayer said, Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And it's like, Lord, how do you do that? I don't know how to do that. And I remember the very night that I decided that I would try to forgive them. And maybe I should pray for him. And I was laying in my bed, and I looked toward the ceiling, and I said, Lord, I lift <coughs> Timothy McVeigh and Terry Nichols up to you. And then it was as though I had hit a brick wall. I didn't know how or what to pray. And I said, Lord, you're going to have to send your Holy Spirit to intercede for me because I don't know how to pray for these men. And I don't know what, if anything, my prayers did for McVeigh and Nichols. But I do know when I began to pray for them, it began to change my life, which was evidenced when I invited Josh Nichols, that scary little son, to my home. You see, he hadn't seen his dad in four years. He was 12 at the time of the bombing, and they just executed McVeigh, and he wanted to see his dad. And I said, well, you know what? I told his mother, if he wants to come, he's welcome to stay in my house with me. And she said, I don't know if he'd be comfortable in not staying with you. I said, I get it. It's not a problem. I said, just come on by and have dinner with me. And if he's not comfortable, that's fine. Well, that evening when they showed up, I went to the door, and this chubby 12-year-old is now a big, tall 16-year-old. And I looked up at him, not knowing what to say. I said, well, I knew you were coming, so I baked a cake. <laughs> and he laughed, and it kind of broke the ice. And we stayed up that night until about 2 o'clock in the morning. He told me how the kids at school had nicknamed him Bomber, and how he ran to get beat up as he walked down the street. He came for one night and stayed for four. Now, I didn't tell one soul that he was at my house. Number one, I didn't want it to be a media circus. Number two, how could I expect my friends and family to understand something that I didn't understand myself? On the last day of his visit, he asked me, would I, he asked me if I'd take him to the bombing memorial. <coughs> and it's like, wow, how can I turn him down after what he's been through? But I didn't really want to be seen out with him. But I, I went. And I'll have to tell you, when I was standing at chairs number 60 and 61, 
in honor to life, my young grandsons, with my arm around the father's son, I knew God was doing a work in my life. 60 Minutes wanted to do an interview with Terry Nichols, just like they had done with Timothy McVeigh. But they had a problem, you see, <clears throat> because Nichols agreed that he would do the interview, but only if I conducted it. He told me he was afraid that Ed Bradley would put him in a bad light. I mean, how can you be put in a bad light, right? <laughs> so 60 Minutes and I wrangled with the prison for a year and a half trying to get in to do that interview, and we met the prison's guideline. I was going in as a correspondent for 60 Minutes, something they've never done before. But I've got the letter at home where the warden <coughs> said in his sound correctional judgment that to allow me in that prison <coughs> would be a safety risk for the prisoners, for the staff, and to the public at large. Now, aren't you glad I'm living here with you at Hot Springs <laughs> <coughs> Well, Terry Nichols was very distraught because he was ready to tell me everything. And he said, he called me, <coughs> and he said, I'll remember, he said, you go to New York on this date, I believe it was November 9th, 2006, and I'm going to tell you everything and tell 60 Minutes they're going to get their story. It's just going to be a phone interview. 60 Minutes was ecstatic, as was I. I was finally going to get answers to all these questions. Nichols could request the date he was going to use the phone, but he had no idea what time he would be allowed to call when they would bring the phone to his cell. So I get to the 60 Minutes set. They have a lady there who does my hair, and they do my makeup, and they get me all wired up, and they begin to inform me. Now, you know, you're not getting out of this chair, not even if nature calls, because we don't want to miss this call. So we began waiting for the call. Well, when I had got, gotten there, I was told by the producer that Ed Bradley was very sick, but if he couldn't do this story, they'd go ahead and take the interview. They'd get some other correspondent to do it. Well, after several hours, the producer comes in the room and he tells us that Ed Bradley has just died. And he said, I'm sorry, Kathy, but we're going to have to shut down the set and start the story on end. And I was devastated for a few minutes, and then I kind of regrouped, and it's like, oh, that's okay. Terry's still going to call and tell me everything. At least I'll get my answers. It doesn't matter if it's on 60 Minutes or not. Because, you see, it's been a roller coaster experience for me. For, you know, I'm waiting for that truth. I need that truth. Terry Nichols never called. I made it back to Little Rock, and a few days later, Terry's mother called me, and she said, Kathy, Terry wanted me to call you and let you know that on the day he was to call you, he was notified by the warden that your number is taken off his calling list. He can't call you anymore. The man had been calling me for 11 years, but the day he was going to do the interview, I was removed from his calling list. I'm thinking, who at the prison would care what he had to say? I felt like someone somewhere cared. Terry's mother knew I was very upset. And she really loved me, that lady did, and I love her as well. She said, I'll tell you what, Kathy, you come to my house in Lapeer, Michigan, next Sunday, and you bring 60 Minutes with you, and when <coughs> Terry calls, you can answer your phone and you can get your story. And I'm like, yeah, right, great. I'm soaring back up the mountaintop. This is going to be wonderful. Then I went to bed that night, and I had what Oprah calls that light bulb moment. And I thought, you know what? If I do that, the prison's probably going to take Terry's mother off this calling list, and she's never going to be able to talk to her son again. And I thought, you know what? I can't do that. And the next morning I got up and called 60 Minutes and I called Joyce and told him I wanted to do it and I was disappointed. But you know what I realized? I realized after all those years of searching for the truth, 
I had found the truth. It just wasn't the one I was looking for. You see, if I had gotten all the answers to my questions and not learned to forgive, all I would have would be answers to my questions and still two dead little boys. I realized that God had not taken my grandsons. He simply received them when they came. There's nothing extraordinary about me. I'm just someone that something extraordinary happened to. 22 years ago, when the bomb went off, I became a victim, and I had no choice. But after the bombing, I did have a choice. And learning to forgive rewrote the end of my story because had it not been for the bombing, I would have never thought about writing a book or being on TV or speaking to groups of people. Seven years after my husband died, I met and married Tom Sanders. And this man has been such a blessing to my life, and that's what brought me to Arkansas. My daughter now is an equine dentist. That's right, she works on horses' teeth, and we are an unusual family. She went on to have two more children. This is Glenn and MJ. Glenn was named after my last, or my late husband, and when he was first born, we called him Little Glenn, and now you can see he's not too little anymore. Between my husband and I, we have 13 living grandchildren, and I always like to qualify that because I have two waiting for me in heaven. And I want to thank you today for allowing me to be here to share my story. Thank you very much.